Welcome to Wisdom for Life, where we sit through philosophy to find practical advice that you can use in your everyday life. Hi, I'm Dan Hayes, and today, I'm as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Greg Sadler, and today we're talking about... Misapplications of informal fallacies, and we're going to tell you what those are in just a moment, but we should talk about why we want to tackle this topic in the first place. We're not just like, you know, filling up airspace or something like that. We feel that it's something important. And I'll, I'll tell my little story and then Dan can jump in and say why he thinks it's uh, particularly important. So with the first one that we're going to look at in just a minute, I've seen so many people in YouTube and social media accusing people of it and, and doing so wrongly in a way that I think if it goes on is going to make things more and more confusing for other people. And that fallacy is called an ad hominem or attacking the person. We're going to tell you about it in just a minute. And so I, I wrote a little bit about this a while back, sort of complaining about it and weirdly enough, people jumped in and they were like, you're committing an ad hominem right now. And I was like, well, that's really weird. You know, we should get a handle on this. And so then when we took on this topic, I, I started thinking about it and Dan started thinking about, well, what are some other ones that people characteristically get wrong and accuse other people of in ways that are going to lead to great confusion. So, Dan, what about you? What what are I, I know you're a pretty logical guy, so you don't mm -hmm. like to see people committing fallacies to begin with, but is there more to the story than that? Well, I, I was just wanted to um disagree with you, Greg, because um you're just a big poopy head. Ad hominem. And, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore anything you just said ah, is wrong. Okay. That, yeah. That's so yep. you're illustrating the point right there. Uh, you're <laughs> that, that's a right. proper ad hominem. That's correct, but just, yeah. But just to say that uh, something, well, uh, anything unnice doesn't actually get to that thing. Yeah, like, you, you see um, bad arguments all the time. People make bad arguments, um, and they often do it like totally unaware that they're making the bad arguments in the first place. Yeah. And that's perfectly fine. And, you know, Fallacies themselves um, aren't doesn't mean your argument or the conclusion to an argument is incorrect, and so oftentimes people will will pull out these fallacies as a way to try to end that conversation and say, right, like, "Well, right. you, you had a fallacy, and therefore, you know, the whole thing is done. Um, you know, you 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 failed, you lost." Um, and the the it really kind of gets to a lot of places where people want to win arguments when. A, you know, a proper usage of arguments is for in a dialogue where we're both trying to come to mm -hmm. some true conclusion. And so the uh, if you're misattributing this into a really antagonistic uh, framework, then you are kind of going about this whole thing wrong. Right. Yeah, so we're we're going to talk about motives for doing this, but we should talk about well what what's a fallacy in the first place? And it's a technical term in logic or critical thinking or some other disciplines and we use them to denote common forms of bad argumentation that have an identifiable structure. So when we say that, you know, something falls into a particular fallacy, we're saying it's an instance of a general type of case. And what's wrong with them? They lead people to, uh, who are taken in by them, to mm -hmm. either accept or reject claims that they don't have good grounds for accepting or rejecting. And as Dan was just pointing out, you can actually have a true conclusion to a fallacious argument. And the conclusion is still true. It's just that the argument doesn't get you there the way that it's supposed to. 
Mm-hmm. Um, now, you know, the vast majority of them are actually arguments, and this is coming from the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which has a, a really nice page on fallacies. Some of them wind up being other things. They, they could be like rhetorical tricks or just explanations or definitions or other types of things that we do in argument. And we're only talking about informal fallacies here, but there are also formal fallacies where it's the very structure of the argument itself. You can like look at it and chart it out and see how it's, it's wrong. But the ones that we're looking at are the ones that people tend to do in, you know, ordinary conversation or in debating politics, uh, discussions about philosophical topics, um, persuading people to take their medicine or not take their medicine or pick whatever else you want. I mean, I don't, I don't think that this is kind of an interesting side note. Is there an area of human communication where we don't see fallacies being used or arising or people falling into them? I can't think of any. Can you? No, like, you know, this is kind of like one of those things from, um, what uh, Daniel Kahneman and Alex Tversky, like the whole like thinking fast and slow, and, and like we have these common ways that we mm. we think about things, and right. they're built into us at a really low level that are really great for saving calories, but they also <laughs> lead us don't always lead us to true conclusions. Sometimes yeah. it's a snake in the uh, the path, and sometimes it's just a stick. But it's easier for us to think it's a snake than it is a stick because it will help us more regularly. Um, but well, I, I just want to like give a, a little bit more information, like you know, when we're talking about a, a formal fallacy, these are like things like the structure, as, so along the lines of like um, if a uh, is equal to b and b is equal to c, then a is equal to c. That is, this is a structure. So this is again, right, the, right. Um, all men are um, all men are are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Um, valid but argument. These are, there. yeah, yeah, and so that that is a a a um a valid argument um structure, whereas um these are going to be things that will still make the form of an argument, um but they will not always lead to true conclusions. Uh, once again, this is assuming that all of the previous portions of the argument, um the premises, are themselves true. Right. That's that that that's uh, a good point to to make. Now, one thing that we do have to say is you might have heard of these by other names because there isn't any one single standard listing of the fallacies. Sometimes we use Latin terms for them. I mean, if you really some of them actually have like Greek terms if you go back to Aristotle, but we don't typically use those. And then there'll be a number of other ones. So like appeal to popularity. Uh, could be ad populum in Latin, but it can also be identified as the bandwagon fallacy. So depending on whose website or book or whatever, um, you might get different names for these. But it's it's the characteristic way of going wrong that we're interested in here. And before we talk about motives for people doing this, um, we should say, like, you know, you want to know more about fallacies. So I've already mentioned the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. But, you know, you can um, take classes. Uh, you could do it academically. You could do it online. There's all sorts of logic and critical thinking and communication classes and uh, resources. There's textbooks out there. One of the great places to get uh, textbooks that a lot of people, I think, don't realize, you can go to your local library and they will have these textbooks that you can just check out. And, you know, you won't have any trouble doing that because nobody else is checking these textbooks out. (laughs) And the librarian would be very happy to help you find them. Yeah, total side note, too. Uh, We should put in a plug. Check out the books that nobody is checking out, because if books aren't checked out after a certain amount of time, they will be called for the discard pile, and they'll just essentially go into landfills. You know, they're not going anywhere else. Maybe the library book sale, but Mm -hmm. typically not that. So you're doing a public service by checking out books. Right. You're saving them. Just uh, it's keeping exactly. them in circulation yeah. by circulating them. Yeah, very good. So why why do people engage in, or why do people accuse other people 
wrongly of engaging in fallacies. What what have you seen, Dan? Um, there's you know more benign and more not so benign answers to this. Like the benign okay. ones are obviously they just don't know. They 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 heard about this thing maybe you know on a podcast or, or something, and someone had told them, or just in conversation, and they they think something is what it's not and that's perfectly fine but then there's other people that actually know these and they are actually acting in bad faith and use these as like a rhetorical technique in order to shut down a conversation or to as i was re- alluding to earlier to win the argument right, right um instead of actually trying to come to a um a well uh s- supported conclusion i've also seen some people who seem to be captivated by fallacies and they you know sort of like you learn a a new technique or tool now you want to try it out everywhere Mm -hmm. so you know this happens to people by the way when they take a critical thinking class I, i used to teach lots and lots of sections of critical thinking when i was at fayetteville state university and you'd have to caution the students hey you're gonna you know those of you who are catching on because not everybody would you are gonna have this temptation to see everybody talking as committing fallacies, which is is not the case. Um, So that might be something. I I think it's gotten worse with the proliferation of what we can call internet culture and how it's permeated non-internet culture. So like I would say that places where um, wrong diagnoses of fallacies are coming up and and then people are getting the wrong idea about them would include like reddit or youtube um what are i mean you, facebook i see a lot of people doing that there um are there any other sites that come to mind for you where you've seen people uh, characteristically doing this this sort of thing i guess twitter to a certain extent mm. right yeah that, that would make sense. But, I mean, the danger here that we're worried about is that it's leading to a culture of sloppy, misinformed applications of these terms. So if I if Dan says something and I'm like, that's an ad hominem, man, you know, and it's not, then if you're listening to this and you buy that, now you're going to use ad hominem that way. And it sort of cheapens the or debases the currency, you could say, of our language that we need to keep fairly, um, fairly real, fairly authentic. Yeah, and and like this is kind of in part like the nature of language. You know, people start using it one way, and then that becomes the way that it becomes used. So, for example, right. um, what is it? Uh, literally means figuratively now, yeah. which is hilarious. <laughs> Um, and then another one that, that we will talk about a little bit later, but um, begging the question right. um, is, is used in, in the colloquial sense as something totally different than what it is actually when we're talking about a, a logical fallacy. Yeah, and I, and I do think we have to be we have to be rigorous but also flexible with this. So like on begging the question, um, I originally was a real stickler about this i now kind of feel like it's gone so far that we're not we're not getting the proverbial genie back in the bottle (laughs) and we may as well just be okay with people misusing that term and and recognize it as a a new use but the other ones i think we kind of want to hold the line right Mm -hmm. um i mean are there any where you when you looked over the list that we selected you were like yeah i'm kind of cool with people calling this this other thing on your um, part? I don't know. I, I'm still on the, um, you know, it's raises the question. If we're going to say begging the question, <laughs> that's the logical fallacy, and that's the only thing we should be talking about. Yeah, that's true. When people are misusing it, they're not, they're not usually using it to accuse a person of a logical fallacy in, in the same sense as um, the original meaning of it i mean maybe they are saying well you're leaving something out and therefore i've got you you know (laughs) so so why why do you think these are so problematic i mean i think there's that debasing the currency Mm. sort of thing um it becomes difficult to to actually figure out what somebody 
is meaning when they're mm. when they're using a word that way. But are there other things that you think are well, problematic? Oh, well, if we're in debasing the currency, then we're in a good company with a whole bunch of Roman emperors here. <laughs> but regardless, <laughs> um, I don't know. Yes, uh, if we if we want to actually come to better conclusions, it is very useful for us to um, have a a good working idea of of how these things actually should be applied. Um, otherwise, you're, you're you're quibbling over you know definitions. And this is definitely one of the later ones, but like you know we're we're trying to set out the rules or the you know protocol for talking about like computers of how we actually go about a process. And if we're yeah. not using the same language and processes then we're going to then come to bad conclusions from this. So what are some other reasons why we would find these false or fake accusations problematic besides just, you know, ruining the currency of our contemporary language? You know, like, for example, people say gaslighting now about everything, ignoring the fact that it originally had a, a real meaning. What are, what are some other issues? I mean, you brought up some of these before. Yeah, it's definitely the idea of um, trying to root out kind of bad faith argument and actors. Uh, you know, if you uh, the entire point, as I said earlier, to to win an argument is to just go through um, and then point these things out, but without actually pointing out your own arguments, making actual good arguments, um, then you're you're just tearing down, and you don't actually you're not saying anything besides hey. You're bad, um, okay. In, in some way, or even if it's like in the incorrect way of putting it. Okay, so let's let's jump into the first one that we've already mentioned: ad hominem, right? Uh, and and a, you know what it is is dismissing a claim or argument that a person has made because you call attention to some negative quality about that person. And there's a proviso there. When that negative quality isn't relevant to the claim or argument or trustworthiness of the person, um, oftentimes it's it's done in terms of insulting the person. And there, there could be cases where, like if somebody's a, a pathological liar, saying, well, I'm not going to believe the thing that you're saying because you are a pathological liar is not an ad hominem, right? Because you've got good grounds for dismissing it. But to say something like, well, you know, you belong to the other political party, so therefore what you're saying doesn't doesn't mean anything. Or you're just a, a gross, you know, uh, foolish person of this sort. Um, it, we're, we're essentially dismissing what could be a good claim on the basis of the, the person. And we could be saying false things about the person, or we could be saying true things about the person. Like, I'm, you know, I don't like people who eat caramels, and you're eating a caramel while you're presenting this thing right now. Therefore, I'm not believing you, buddy. That, mm -hmm. That's an ad hominem, right? Right. So I mean, you, you see this, all, like, other places, just uh, not even in arguments, but it's just like, hey, like, you're maybe you're interviewing someone and they had. They could be really incredibly qualified, but uh, they have some tick or something. They're just like, I just, I, I really dislike people like that, and you totally yeah, dismiss yeah. everything or the the potential that they could be a, a good fit. Um, and so, I guess that's true. Um, so where we're, we're where talking people about, have been going wrong? Oh, oh, where people have been going wrong with this is seeing any sort of insult as just being an ad hominem or even criticism. So I. I've seen this in YouTube videos, uh, comments that people will leave on one of my videos about, say, Plato, right? And I'll say, oh, you're, you're wrong about that. You've got, you've got Plato mixed up with somebody else. And then they'll say, oh, nice ad hominem. And I'll be like, where's the ad hominem in mm -hmm. this? You just don't know what you're talking about. And, you know, I'm calling attention to that. Um, I, I suppose in a very extenuated way, you could say, well, I'm dismissing what they have to say, but I'm actually dismissing what they have to say because it's displaying that they don't know what they're talking about. I'm it's not saying, the... oh, go ahead. It's, it's on, just on the basis of their argument, not of the person. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying you stink, therefore I don't like stinky people and stinky people have nothing to say about Plato. <laughs> you know? 
<laughs> so I, I've seen lots and lots of people doing this. And I actually made a kind of joke about it on the internet once. I was like, telling somebody that they're wrong about something is not an ad hominem. Um, mm -hmm. Just insulting a person is not an ad hominem. Now, if I say that you're an idiot because you don't understand the use of ad hominem, and therefore we shouldn't believe you when you accuse people of an ad hominem, that's an ad hominem, you know, so performatively enacting one. Um, and right. as you can guess, that did not go over well. <laughs> Yeah. And, and people get really defensive about like these types of things. It's like, okay, step right. back for a moment. We're we're talking about ideas and and if you are you're taking this into yourself too much, then you're probably uh not focusing on the actual important thing here, which is actually trying to, you know, work through an idea. Yeah, sort out what's what's true and what isn't. And I think that this is the one that's at greatest danger at this present time of there's like an entire community of online, mostly guys, who now dismiss people who are giving them legitimate criticism or just insulting them. And they're doing exactly what you were describing before. They want to win. They want to defend themselves. And so, therefore, they trot out this accusation of ad hominem as if that's that's now that you've committed an ad hominem, there's no more debate about things. Right. And shutting down that, that argument. And, and yes, I didn't think I was going to bring it, but like, this is basically a fallacy fallacy. Okay. That, that, because you got to you, explain you, what that is, though. For our, our... A fallacy fallacy is a, a fallacy where one says, oh, you have committed a fallacy. Therefore, whatever you were talking about is now wrong. I was like, that's not how any of this works. <laughs> Yeah, I guess you're right. The fallacy fallacy could be looked at as a subclass of what ad hominem traditionally has meant, right? Dismissing the claim on the basis of something bad about the person. Right. And we, we could probably apply this to many of these other things as well, at like kind of a base level, because they're misusing it in a way. And then the the output of it is, therefore, you know, your argument is wrong. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So is there anything else that you want to say about ad hominem in particular? Um, I, I, besides that, you, you always look like a scarecrow there, Greg. <laughs> you, I really want to just knock you down because now we're going to be talking about a straw man fallacy. Well, you haven't gotten yet to an ad hominem. Uh, you've got to somehow dismiss what I have to say. Ah, uh, okay. Um, I. Uh, you you have no guts. It's all just straw. Um, <laughs> you straw man. Therefore, uh, anything you say is wrong. Okay. Uh, very broad scope there for things. So <laughs> straw man fallacy. I think a lot of people are familiar with this. This is when you um, take somebody's claims or argument and you you provide a basically a fake version of it that's weaker, distorted, or oversimplified. And then you can dismiss it, right? Because mm -hmm. obviously nobody is stupid enough to buy this this crazy thing that you've just presented. So, um, you know, we should come up with a few examples that people can relate to. If you say that um, you shouldn't take a class with professor so-and-so because um, they believe – it's something that they presented in class. It's not even a position that they, they hold, but they were presenting I know, Nietzsche's position on morality, right? We should all be masters, not slaves. Don't, don't buy into the herd. Be cruel. Be mean and stuff like that. And so you're like, well, you know, Professor George thinks that that's how people should behave with each other. So nobody would believe that sort of crazy crap, right? Uh, don't take a class with that guy. I mean, that would be a, an example of a straw man do you have any of that come to mind right away yeah you, you see that in politics a lot so oh, for right, example, yeah. um it's like uh um hey maybe we should reduce the budget for the military and then someone will go back and return oh you want our um you want to destroy america you want our enemies to win uh um, yeah or uh i guess another one would be like hey let's um make a, a better uh, social security um, net to you know catch the, these people that you know sometimes fall through the cracks. It's like, yeah. oh, you just want to destroy the economy. Like, you know, it, it's it's 
taking something that's really tangential to it, saying that's what your entire argument is, because that's a lot easier to knock down, and then you're like, well... No huh? sane person would possibly agree with this, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, or or you, you see the, that's just communism, or socialism all the time, <laughs> and, and then you're just like, ah, well, dismiss it, because socialism is bad, so I can just, whatever it is, I, I apply it to, so, uh, now give it the label socialism, it's therefore bad, and I can just poop. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a legitimate fallacy. People, like you said, do this in politics all the time. I think that you can say people do this like when they're comparing products, mm -hmm. if they're like too closely competitive brands. Um, and, and we do this in all sorts of other things. I think this happens a lot in personal relationship arguments. So what isn't the fallacy? If you're actually pointing out real weaknesses in your interlocutor or opponent's position that that you know are accurate um that's not a straw man you're not just um misrepresenting their their argument right so it's easy to accuse people of having straw man you oh you just you don't you don't understand what i'm saying mm -hmm. you're misrepresenting me um, I, I think this is a dodge that a lot of people use when they've put forth a bad argument to begin with. They accuse their opponent of straw manning them. Mm. And what you should be doing is like, I feel you may have under misunderstood my argument. Let's go through this again. And you got to pull down like, you know, individual points. You're like, Hey, let's like dig into it. That's the way that you should be actually dealing with this. Um, but, uh, I guess we all often always talk about, or not, we often talk about the kind of the opposite of this is, which is steel manning argument, where you try to go through and, and give the the most charitable understanding of an argument that uh, is possible. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, but when um, there are bad arguments, and if you can pull yeah. point out the wrong, the things that are actually wrong about the argument, um, that is not. Um, straw man it it's actually working through the argument yeah and i've seen people i think and i'd be i'd be curious to get your take on this um misuse steel manning not in the sense of accusing somebody of doing it when they're not but rather calling for it as like something obligatory or mm -hmm. required if you want to be uh discussing things in good faith like i i don't think that we always have to distort the interlocutor's position to make it stronger, more palatable, or more reasonable. Mm. In some cases, maybe we're doing the wrong thing by steel manning. Um, I mean, it, it could be good to do that if we don't really understand their argument. Because is it what you're saying? This, you know, right? But if if it's a bad argument, I don't I don't feel like we have to steel man it. And I think there's a lot of people out there who are acting as if that's incumbent upon us but maybe that's just the circles i move in i mean are you seeing anything like that or i don't know if it's incumbent i think it's a good uh strategy to try to use especially if you're really unfamiliar with a, a right, an idea right. or a uh like a whole subset set of philosophy that you're not familiar with and it's like okay i might be bringing a whole bunch of baggage to this because i'm looking at these things through certain paradigms or i might be using language in a, a way so this is get down to our equivocation fallacy i might be using this term in this way where oh, yeah, this yeah. subset yeah. of uh of discipline it actually means this and so you know if you're not defining terms well enough really early on then you might be Make, jumping to conclusions about the arguments uh, much quicker than you would if you're kind of slowly going through it and trying to say, okay, if you mean this, do you mean, what do you mean by that? Right, um, right. Yeah. I mean, maybe also in personal arguments and discussions, like if we know that the person is generally a good person, not arguing just to win points or something like that, and they say something that seems really kind of weird, we could be like, they probably have just poorly articulated what they're trying to say. Maybe mm -hmm. we then take the more charitable interpretation. Uh, so speaking of relationships, I was like, I could think yeah. of, say you're having an argument with your significant other and, um, or and discussion. Let's try to be a bit <laughs> more civil here. Okay. Um, 
<laughs> Although an argument is not inherently a negative thing. Right. Um, yeah. But to say, like, to make this jump from, um, like, say you failed to um, wash the dishes. Okay. And they're like, therefore, you don't love me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, that 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 shows that you don't love me anymore. Yeah, I feel like this is like okay, you're you're taking a, a really fast and loose like connection here, and so um, just because I don't do the dishes does not mean that I'm, I don't love you anymore. That is not the argument that you should be doing here. Is um, so let's let's try to like what are the better uh, ways that we could actually make conclusions about things? What would be the steel manning of that? <laughs> Well, you know, I, as you're saying that, I'm thinking this is a great case where, like, if it was a math problem, somebody has skipped a lot of steps, right? Mm -hmm. And what's going on there is what we call implicit reasoning. There, there are some other premises that are built in that are the, the other person buys. They just haven't articulated them to, because to get from not washing the dishes to you don't love me anymore, there's a lot of intermediary steps that you got to go through. Um, but steel manning could mean, you know, suggesting, uh, do you, are you saying that because this little thing here is connected to this and this and this and this, and that leads you to this massive conclusion? I mean, that would, I think, be uh, a perfectly reasonable thing to, to do. And, and if, you, if you've got somebody who generally doesn't say crazy stuff, mm -hmm. and then they say something like that, you probably want to be like, how did they get from point a to point z you mm -hmm. know what what is b c d all the other alphabet you know letters along the way maybe you have to actually go into greek letters if there's too many of them you know? <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's talk about another one that i think i'm okay with at this point which is begging the question now in the past begging the question. It's actually got a Latin term, petitio principi, right? Which means asking for the very thing that you're, you're using. Um, it's a circular argument, argument where you are assuming or smuggling the conclusion into the premises. That is not the way that most people use this term anymore. We see people constantly, especially in like talking head news shows or other opinion shows where they say, well, this begs the question that, and you're like, no, it doesn't beg that question, <laughs> right? And what they mean is, is it leaves this question open or it raises the question that I would like to ask you now in the uh, the show and um, you know when we accuse somebody of it as a fallacy I think in a lot of cases it we're, we're just saying there's something that hasn't been determined yet so it's not really a fallacy when we accuse somebody of it um, it's a sloppy use of the term yeah I kind of feel myself like it's gone too far. There's no way we're going to bring linguistic usage back and be rigorous about this. So I've, I've gotten okay with it. You mm. know, it's still great on my nerves a bit. You know, I'm like, somebody should know better, but I don't know. What, what do you think? Is I will. I will take out my sword and try to slay that storm that is enveloping me. I know this, I'm not I mean, going to win, but gonna I'm not going to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just know that I, I'm not going to be able to stop it, but I'm not going to be okay with it. Okay, so you have sort of the same position that I do, but you're more unhappy about it, so to speak. Yeah, and, and, and I, I might still bring it up as like you're not begging the question, you're raising it. But <laughs> now, <laughs> just... when you when you do that, because I assume that you probably do do that, mm -hmm. um, how do people react? Uh, sometimes it's okay, and and sometimes I get pushed back, um, b because that's the accepted usage of it, and that's yeah. kind of how language changes. And I understand that, but um, I don't know. Even though you uh, are I, technically correct, yes, okay, and technically is the best sort of correct. <laughs> <laughs> what was that from? I saw uh, that the drama. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> so I saw somebody it? using that as a meme recently. <laughs> Fermi, uh, Hermes is a bureaucrat. Oh, so, right, right. <laughs> uh, the, the head bureaucrat is like, you are correct, or technically correct, the best sort of correct.
Yeah. I, I actually, this is a total side note. I had some students because we were talking about egoism in uh, my ethics classes, my applied ethics uh, classes at Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design. And we were looking at like this notion that some people have that like everything people do is driven by self-interest. You know, even when we're like being nice to somebody else, it's just because we like being somebody who is nice to somebody else. And you can see this guy's like, you know, eyebrows kind of knitting and something going on in his head. And he's like, I think we need to talk about that as technical egoism, but not real egoism, you know. If somebody wants to buy that position, yes, technically everything we do is self-interested because we have selves, but it seems really weird to say that like doing something nice to somebody else, like, you know, buying them a pie and bringing them the pie and letting them eat that in front of you because you, you enjoy seeing them happy is somehow the same sort of thing as like, you know, bringing them a pie and then taking the pie away because you, you know, you want the pie for yourself. These don't seem to be the, the same uh, class of, of uh, action and, and motivation. And I, and I kind of like that. We, we ended up using that term technical egoism in the next mm -hmm. class session as well. Yeah. And the question is, like, if that is true, then yeah, why is it true that we we – are motivated by self-interest for doing these nice things we do. And I guess the, right. the oh, what is it called? The reductio ad absurdum that I, I kind of pull with that is that there's all these instances of, like, they call them heroes. There was There's a, a, a organization that gives out these prizes to these people that do heroic acts okay. for absolute strangers because um, they see them like, you know, go off the side of the road or something, and they like run out yeah, of their yeah, car, yeah. and they might be specifically going into places that are dangerous, like you know, um, with a place with a whole bunch of bowls or something, and and you're, like pulling a, out a kid, or there's a a fire going on in a car, and someone runs in there and and pulls that person out, and like if if I'm like really focused on my ego, why are there so many instances of these seemingly totally selfless acts yeah. that for people that you potentially have no connection to, and a lot of them people are total strangers. Yeah. Um, and like, it's a premise that works at like, at least it gives um, this, this technical egoism gives you a place for like, okay, well, um, it's good for me to work in a society because, or, or you know, uh, have a well-functioning society with like uh, some good security and, and make sure that people are are doing well off for themselves. Because if you make sure that people are prospering themselves, there's less chance that they're going to go into crime, which produces a society that I want to live in more than like the you know a Mad Max hellscape. Yeah, yeah, I want that. Um, but, but who the hell thinks about that while they're saving somebody? Right. right. <laughs> it's like, well, I'm going you know, like, to sit down here and be like a utilitarian. It's like, well, what is each individual instance? Like, what is going to yeah, produce yeah. the most happiness for everyone? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. We Peter can think Singer, about this. Peter Singer points out, because uh, when he's talking about reciprocal altruism, right, where we're, we're mm -hmm. being good to other people because we expect them to be good to us, he says that this doesn't really work if people catch on to exactly the sort of line of reasoning that, that you just articulated, because they'll be like, well, I don't know if I can trust this person. They don't mm -hmm. really have the right kind of motivation. I want them to instinctively or spontaneously respond in a altruistic uh, as opposed to egoistic way and save me from the 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 river that I'm flowing down or what whatever it happens to be, you know. Yeah, this is like uh, kind of the reason why a lot of people like don't give to the people asking for money on the street. It's like, "Oh, well, I don't know if I can trust them to do with that money the thing that they either said they're going to do or that yeah, I yeah. want them to do. And I was like, oh, like that's out of your hands. What is the action you're going to do right now? Don't worry about like how it's going to eventually come back to you. Is, is it the right thing in the first place or not? Yeah. Well, coming back to fallacies. So another <laughs> really popular one, slippery slope, right? And people will say, oh, you know, you're committing the fallacy of slippery slope. So what, what is that fallacy? It's, it's saying that one thing will 
necessarily or inevitably lead to another thing, which will lead to another thing. And then at the bottom of the slope, you got something that's really horrific. So like, you know, if you, you know, there's that old thing, if you give a mouse a cookie, pretty soon the whole world blows up, right? Well, no, you, you got a lot of steps along the way and none of them seem to be absolutely necessary. Or another popular one, it certainly was when I was a kid, and I think there's still people doing this. If you smoke one joint of marijuana, mm-hmm. you are going to be a heroin junkie. And you're like, well, how the hell did you get from that to that? Well, you know, marijuana is the gateway to hard drugs. And so if you smoke one joint, then you're going to want another joint. And then that's going to lead to becoming a dope smoker. And then you're going to start hanging around with these people. And some of them are going to be doing heroin or meth or pick whatever else you want. <laughs> and s- soon you're in that heroin den you know, shooting up every single day, stealing purses from old ladies to uh, feed your dirty habit. Okay, that that's a slippery slope fallacy, right? Um, and uh, Yeah, you're absolutely right. It is still prevalent nowadays. Yeah, but there are people who will accuse, I mean, we should call out slippery slope fallacies, but there are people who will accuse other people of anytime you say that one thing leads to another, they're like, you're committing slippery slope, right? And mm-hmm. that's not true. To begin with, there are some actual s- slippery slopes. So you, you know, if you smoke a, a joint, you're not going to become a heroin junkie. However, if you start shooting up heroin, there's a good chance that you're going to, that is a slippery slope, right? Right. Um, it's not like a lot of people are like, yeah, I tried the heroin. Eh, really fun, but wasn't for me. You know, I, I just put it aside or something like that. You know, that's why we make a distinction between, um, softer drugs like marijuana and harder drugs like, uh, crystal meth or heroin or, you know, PCP or things like that. Um, and then, you know, the, the, there are cases where people are abusing this. Um, but we don't want to we don't want to just dismiss any sort of um causal connection that people want to to make we i guess we have to look at it each each time kind of carefully are these things really connected what are the likelihoods right so it's just as bad to say well this thing will in- inevitably lead to the no- the other one it's just as bad to falsely say that somebody's making that sort of diagnosis this is if you look at like the scientific community there are there are two types of like studies that can be done you can have mm. correlational studies or causal studies right, and right. The, the difference here is that there has to be on um, one the the connection has to be much stronger for us to actually put a uh, a um causal stamp on it um and so for example yeah. like the, the, a classic example is that um there's a correlation between ice cream and shark attacks. The more people eat ice cream, there are more shark attacks there are. The issue is that that's not the causal relationship. Right. The causal yeah. relationship is people in the summer go swimming and people in the summer eat ice cream. That is the, the actual causal relationship. Yeah, yeah. And unless you can actually prove that causal relationship, then you are making that slippery slope fallacy. But just because one thing might lead to another, well, if it is causal and ain't a slippery soap fallacy, that is just a causal relationship. Yeah. I, I think, too, if we speak in a qualified way, we can legitimately say, okay, it's not 100% that A is going to lead to B. Maybe it's just 80%, right? And then um, it's not 100% that, that B is going to lead to C, but, but C is really, really bad. So maybe you shouldn't do A because of the likelihood of it getting to something pretty bad. You know, like uh, you could, I don't know, you you might not really damage yourself too much by drinking too much every night. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like a, a, a nice six pack every day or something like that. Um, there are some people who do that their whole life. And they don't even seem to suffer a lot of cognitive decline. They seem to be okay. So it's not 100% guaranteed. 
But there's a pretty good chance, you know, <laughs> that if you do do this thing, it's going to lead to this thing. Um, there's no guarantee you're going to have liver failure or burn your brain cells out or anything like that and then suffer this horrible end. Um, but it's it's a pretty good chance if you're heavily drinking um, all the time. Um, not everybody can be Lemmy Kilmeister and drink a fifth of whiskey a day and, and then, you know, only – live into your 70s and die of cancer, uh, which seemed to be unrelated to the drinking. <laughs> so. No. And, you know, like, your, your mileage may vary, but yeah, there's, there's definitely a correlation between these things. It's like the same thing with um, uh, what's it called? A high correlation. Like, uh, it was smoking has right. a high probability of you getting a lung or um, lip or tongue. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yes, it is a, a carcinogen. Uh, but not every person's going to do it. Some people have really good genes that allow them to, you know, get rid of those uh, cancerous cells all the time. Hell, you and I right now ha- probably have some uh, small number of cancerous cells in our body, but our body has um, defenses. Some, uh, defenses, you know, like yeah. notices when they start doing weird stuff and kills them off. Um, True. Yeah. But so you, know, you sound like you're speaking from authority here. Oh, uh, <laughs> don't believe a thing I say. I am not an authority at all. <laughs> uh, so a an argument from authority, asserting a claim is true because some supposed authoritative expert says it's true when the person's expertise is not relevant. Yeah. Why is so this a problem? there's a lot of people who will accuse, well, they'll say that you've committed an argument from authority when you're citing an actual authority who you should be citing, mm-hmm. right? Um, so a great example of this um, would be, I don't know, in textual studies. If, if um, I, I've got some colleagues who are just like whizzes at reading ancient Greek and they spent their whole career on this sort of thing. If I defer to them and I say, listen, uh, so-and-so, Anthony Long says that this is the case or Margaret Graver says that this is the case. And I, I actually think that they know what, the, what they're talking about. And then you come along and you're like, you've committed an argument for from authority, my friend. Um, no, you're wrong about that. They are actual authorities. Now, if I go to, uh, you know, Anthony Long about diet advice or Margaret Graver about, I don't know, whether the Packers are likely to win this season or not, but she, she doesn't know. <laughs> she'd, she'd be the first to – actually, what she would do is she would fix you with kind of a glare, and then she would, like, turn her head a bit, and then she would say, I'm sure I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, there are a lot of cases where we do want to invoke authorities because it's the right thing to do. And unfortunately, in our culture, and I think this is a bigger problem now with the internet because of the proliferation of uh, conspiracy theories Mm -hmm. and distrust of authority, there's this tendency to say, oh, you're you're buying into this narrative that the scientists are putting out or um, that, uh, you know, that the National Institute of Health is putting out, pick pick whatever else you want. And a lot of people will dismiss authorities who are legitimate authorities and then go seek out, not, let's just call them non-authorities because I was mm. tempted to say something kind of mean, um, who confirm the, the preconceived notions or biases that they already have. No. Right? So, yeah, this is definitely one. It goes into motivated reasoning, which we talked about at a previous moment. I know. Well, to say what that is, though, because people it's might like not you, you've remember. got an idea, preconceived idea, and then you you go around shopping for information that's going to <laughs> support that idea, um, and then once you find someone, it's like, oh, yeah, look there, I've got I've got proof right there, I've got evidence, and that that the whole thing yeah. works, and yeah, um, and so the the, the basically they're they're making this argument from authority and say it's like. Eh, Therefore, hey, an authority says it, therefore it's wrong. You can't trust the authorities, which that's not what it's trying to say. It's saying <coughs> just because they are an authority, that doesn't mean it necessarily is correct. But the authorities, especially in a field of study, are the people that are most likely to know what the heck they're talking about in the first yeah. place. And, you know, you could have authorities even in 
a particular area where they'll say, I'm good with this part, but I'm not good with this part. So for example, I, I, you know, I teach philosophy classes. That doesn't mean that I've actually read every philosopher. As a, as a matter of fact, I've probably read at best one you know, one tenth of a percent of the available philosophy books that are worth reading out there. And that's probably a high estimate. You know, there's probably way more people than that. So if you ask me about Plato, I can tell you more or less what he's saying. Am I as good as a Plato expert who spends all their time doing that? No, you know, and at a certain point, I, I just say, well, I don't I don't know, you know, or I don't think anybody knows. Um, I had somebody asking me today about the relationship between Hegel's phenomenology of spirit and the science of logic and whether they're connected in this way or that way. And I was like, buddy, none of us know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> People have theories, but we don't really know because the things don't map onto each other that well. And real authorities will often use pretty qualified language. And this gets left out oftentimes in, in reporting. And I think that's probably a problem as well that contributes to this distrust of authorities because the authority will typically be saying something like, all things being equal, here's what the best data that we have says, I interpret it to mean it probably signifies this, and then the reporter goes out and says, you know, eating oatmeal will destroy your brain, authority says, you know, mm -hmm. and you're like, that's not actually what they, what they claimed. <laughs> It's like, we, we did a preliminary study of like 50 people and we got these preliminary data. Yeah, yeah. Our, our conclusion is that we need more research because there seems to be maybe a correlation here. Um, therefore, you know, this is the whole thing of like, red wine is good for you. Red wine is bad for you. Coffee is good for you. Coffee is bad for you. Back right, and forth, right. back and forth. And no one knows what the heck. Like, if you read the the science reporting, it's like, yeah, like, yeah, it's it's not quite settled. There, there's more stuff to be done but you're jumping to conclusions and you so, know oh. you're you're too young to remember this because it happened before your time when i was a kid eggs were either the superfood that everybody should be eating or they were going to kill you <laughs> and it would fluctuate between those two like every couple of years and people would like you know chew each other out they'd be like i can't believe that you're feeding your kids eggs at breakfast or do you want to hasten them to an early grave you know people would get quite worked up about this sort of stuff and it was all coming from you know reporting you know of course there was no internet back then but it was reporting in magazines and newspapers and on tv and stuff like that so yeah i, I i'm slightly aware of it but definitely was not in the middle of it when i was aware of things like that um but i did want to I think add the in, egg thing has died down yeah yeah <laughs> um is uh there is definitely room for healthy skepticism like especially in the scientific community that skepticism yeah. is actually a core to the scientific process and the scientific methods does not prove things it actually fails to disprove them and so we don't believe things because the scientific authority says so, we accept the results of the best data. However, the experts are the ones that actually know how to interpret the data. And so if you're going in there and you have like, you know, say you're um, a pilot and you, you think okay. you're, you're hot, yeah. hot stuff because you're a pilot and uh, you, you go and read a, a paper that a nutritionist puts out there, it's like, well, yeah, you might know how to like fly a pain and read all the uh, instruments and, and make sure that people don't, you know, die when you crash and whatnot. But what does that have anything to do with you know, your understanding of what nutrition science is at the moment? Unless you start like really digging into it, um, a lot of these words might mean something totally different than you think they are, and to oh, feel yeah, that you yeah. can come to an informed conclusion from the uh, just a. Uh, a layman's reading of a paper um, results in you probably having really bad conclusions. And so in this place, the people that have the best background and understanding of these things are the ones that can actually interpret it to kind of like give you the, the layman what they actually are meaning. Yeah. You know, and then even if there is like um, a lack of consensus in a expert community, Usually what you'll find is that if, if experts or authorities disagree and they're all like actual authorities, they will be able to say what the reasons for disagreement are, where the dividing lines 
fall and how, you know, the other person's views aren't totally unreasonable, but they don't buy this premise or this premise that the other person mm-hmm. does accept. You know, I think that's, that's a, a good index for people who really do know what they're, they're talking about. So, um, you know, a pilot could disagree with another pilot about how you ought to handle a tricky situation where, I don't know, lightning is hitting your plane or something like that. Because maybe there's three different ways of understanding that, you know. But they're not going to be like, everybody get parachutes, you know, <laughs> something like that. And this reminds th- me, the end of most uh, scientific papers, if you're putting out a paper, one of the sections says, what could have you been wrong about? What were oh, some places yeah. that you you might have you know screwed up your uh, experiment or data gathering? It, it, there's a, a built-in like, hey, I have to be yeah, like, yeah. kind of humble about the things that I'm actually wanting to talk about. You know, I will say that's not ubiquitous in philosophical papers or papers in you know linguistics or mm-hmm. matters like that. But I have seen it's not done just at the end in a formulaic way, but quite often people will say, okay, so I've presented this interpretation. Um, some other, somebody might raise these objections. I think I can answer these objections or somebody might have a different way of framing this or looking at this. Here's how I would respond to that. And I, I tell my students, because sometimes they're afraid to put that into papers themselves. Mm-hmm. They're like, I think I should present the strongest case. And I'm like, no, no. If you can show that you actually have entertained other possibilities and you've ruled them out for good reasons, that is incredibly persuasive. And it shows that you're you're doing your due diligence. Mm-hmm. You're actually being a critical thinker. And they're very surprised by that, you know. Well, it- before you get to, you know, the post-secondary level, and it's like you have to have the right answer, and that's right. the thing that matters. But once yeah, you're yeah. actually there trying to do some research, and you've you've got to like show your work, like it's it's like I guess in math, like you got to show your work if you're gonna come up with a good argument and and really dig into it and yeah. show everything. See, now, interestingly, I was a math major, and I skipped steps all the time because I could carry things out in my my head, and I really resented being made to show all the steps Mm. until I started making stupid mistakes, and then I realized why it's so helpful to... um, to check all your work, you know, to, to show all your work. And then when I had to collaborate with other people, they would be like, how the hell did you get from here to here? And I'd be like, well, there's this, 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 and this. And then I, I realized it's just better to actually show your work the whole time. I, I think that we're getting close to the end of our time. So do you want to lead us out on a uh, final idea yeah. or passage? Um, yeah, I guess we are end today's with the words of um, Chris Jammy. There's more to logic than identifying logical fallacies. <laughs> <laughs>